Good evening, and welcome back to your We Care Ministry Support Team. We are so excited about today. We're so ready for our discussion for today because we're back at COVID from a frontline workers' perspective. And we have our own PA Janae Lampkin. So get ready, tag your friends, share with your friends because we got an excited to exciting topic today. So this time I'm gonna turn you over to Vanessa Flood. Thank you, Kim. Yes, we do have an exciting topic and we have an exciting guest. And it is, as uh, was stated, Janae Lampkin. She's a PA and she works at, let me get this right, Peripheral Vascular Associates, Doctors of Arteries and Veins. And uh, <laughs> Janae joined uh, PVA for sure in 2015. And that's located in the downtown area um, at the Baptist Hospital. She does inpatient vascular services. And she's going to talk to us all about what she sees from day in to day out, what she hears, what she goes through, what she assesses, what she wish would change, mm -hmm. <laughs> what she wish you would do and I would do so she wouldn't have to do. And <laughs> what she do. so we're hoping to get the information needed to make her job easier and to make our lives longer. So just a little bit about Janae. She did get her education um, at the University of Incarnate Word, a Bachelor of Science in Biology, a master's program, um, degree at University of Texas Health Center, Science Center. Also, she has certifications, in the National Commission of Certifi Certification for Physician Assistants, Certifying Body, and the Texas Medical Board licensing body so she is not a bootleg pa y'all amen she is real so <laughs> we need to listen to people who actually have what it takes to teach us something so we're honored to have janae here today and we are you know just so glad that she took out time out of her busy schedule to help us better understand what's COVID doing to our bodies, what COVID can do, and what we can do to prevent COVID. So, uh, Sister Kimberly, what do you have to say? Well, first, I want to say welcome, Janae. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. We know as a mom and a wife and all of the other hats that you wear, and, mm -hmm. and it's just been your birthday, so happy birthday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And, and you got family over and we appreciate you taking your time to just um, spend a few moments uh, helping us to understand a little bit better about COVID and what you face and how we can do things differently and better, just a little bit better. Um, so I know that you are, um, you do surgeries and all of that stuff, right? Um, um, you deal mainly with diabetics or it's just everybody? Everybody. Uh, the San Antonio population is usually comprised of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and arterial insufficiency. Those are the main risk factors that I cover. And then also your smokers. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good to know because, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I know a little bit, but I'm always asking questions. So my quit, my initial question is, and I want to get this started off so that we can get as much information as we possibly can. So what for you as a frontline worker would be the most frustrating thing that you face on a daily basis that could be totally prevent preventable? Um, so first, I want to say thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, I don't take this lightly to stand in front of you guys and share my knowledge. So thank you very much uh, for having me. As far as the frustrating side that I see um, right now, I think that we are facing so much in the hospital on a regular basis of things that we have no control over. Um, but there's a large component of this pandemic that we do have control over. Um, and it's pretty much staying within your COVID bubble and trying to decrease your risk of COVID-19. And for me on a personal level to see so many people that are getting fatigued by COVID, I understand that we just hit our one year anniversary. Um, and 
people that think that this is a hoax or there's nothing real about it and they're still going on with regular activities or they've um they're just trying to get back to their normal life which i understand but we're still battling this beast in the hospital and unfortunately we're the only ones that are seeing the worst of the worst um because you're not there to see it so um that would be what's frustrating for me because i can guarantee you if you saw what I saw every day, you'd be in your house locked up, not going up, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we appreciate you, um, what you do. We really appreciate what you do and what all of the other frontline workers that are in the hospital on a day in, day out basis, taking care of our loved ones and our friends and our family members and being there with them you know, at the end when no one else can be. Um, and it's gotta be pretty tough on you guys. And we are praying for you. Thank and you. we just want you to know that we appreciate you on We Care. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. All right, I have a question. Um, what do you say to someone that has gone in and had a test done uh, and it came up negative? And maybe three days later, they gotten sick and they went right back and had the test done. And now it's positive just that quick. Okay. Within three days. So usually the normal test that is ran is called a rapid test. Uh-oh, I'm losing your connection. We can hear and see you. Okay, usually the first test that is um, offered by most primary care physicians or uh, the pop-up clinics or in the emergency rooms are your rapid testing, which is an antigen test. That is only going to be positive if you've been infected with the virus for about after seven to 10 days. Um, pretty much the way to know whether or not you have the rapid test is if they give you results in less than 24 hours and you're not in a hospital setting, that is the rapid test. And so it takes your body at least five days to mount a response to, for that test to be positive. And so at the beginning of the COVID infection, we in the hospital didn't even really fully understand the differences between the test. So the way that we found out about it was we were running tests and the, with the rapid test would be negative. And then we'd turn around and we would do the PCR test, which is actually more accurate. Um, and that would show that the patient would be positive. So that was how we found out that there's a huge discrepancy with the rapid PCR test versus the antigen test. So speaking on it on a personal level, um, I took my kids to get tested because um, I had gotten exposed from the hospital and I was concerned. And then my son had a fever. And so I went to the urgent care and they were trying to do the rapid test. And as a provider, I had to pretty much fight to get the PCR. And um, the, re the recommendations are if you're low risk or low probability to actually be infected, that that's why they're doing the rapid test. So the way to know is if you pretty much get your test results back in less than 24 hours, that is not an accurate test. So if you have had a direct exposure and you were not doing the baseline precautions of wearing a mask at minimum, and you have come into contact with somebody that is positive, you should assume that you are positive and be under quarantine as well, okay? If your test is negative, please get retested, but don't be surprised if you pop up later, positive. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good information. So, what and I do think, you I think that spins, that explains why we've had a lack of control with this virus is because you're going for these rapid tests and you think that you're negative. And so you're going for these family gatherings and, and uh, going mm. to football games and because you've been tested negative and you're negating the fact that you've had a direct mm. exposure. And so now you test it negative, but you're in the incubation period. You're going to your Thanksgiving dinner with 15 people in the house. You've exposed all of them. And now the day after Thanksgiving, 
now you're showing symptoms. And so that's how we've, we've not been able to get control of the numbers. Wow. Wow. That's something to think about. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so if you had a direct exposure, you should be in a two week quarantine unless you get the PCR test. Okay. And can you ask for that directly and they have to give it to you or you have to go somewhere where that's always given? You have to fight for it. Um, I, I really had to push to get mine done and explain to my pediatrician, no, no, I'm in the healthcare. My husband's in healthcare. My children are in daycare. My kid is high risk. This is not just us walking by the grocery store and someone sneeze. We are a high risk household. Um, so you have to really push for it. Usually if you go in and you're asking for a PCR, um, they, they really don't give you too much pushback because that means that you've done your homework and you know that there's a concern. Um, but I would say emphasize that you've had a direct exposure and that should make them want to do the PCR over the antigen. Now, mind you, you get your test results back for the rapid in 24 hours. The PCR can take three to five days. So what are you going to do within those three to five days? You need to assume that you're positive and be under quarantine until you get that antigen test back. So that's another reason why they're not doing it because you're still down for three to five days. You see what I'm saying? You want, you want your test results so that way you can go back to your regular activities within 24 hours. No, for the antigen, you would still, but until you get your test results, you need to assume that you're positive. Okay. And tell us again what the, that, those initials stand so for. So the, the rapid is mm -hmm. an antigen test. That's the one where you get the results back in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then the PCR, which is more accurate, is the one that you get back within five to seven days. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can do it three days, but usually they have to send it out to a different kind, uh, state to get the results. So that's why it takes so long. Okay. Okay. So my real question now is a fun one that I heard you say about wearing a mask. So what's the deal and how do you feel about people wearing or not wearing masks? Should we be wearing a mask? And if so, why? Yes. Um, this is a respiratory virus that is spread in the air. You should be wearing a mask. Anytime that you're in contact outside, I know I've, I've heard a couple people use the phrase COVID bubble, um, but anybody outside of your household, you should be wearing a mask. And so let's talk about the types of masks. Um, the news have done studies on multi-layered masks versus single layers. Those gator necks um, really are not effective. And that's simply because of the layers that you have. And so you want to have multiple layers in your mask. Okay. Um, but anytime you leave your house and you're coming in contact with people outside of your household, or if people are coming into your home and they're not in your COVID bubble, you should mask up. Um, in the hospital, not only do we wear masks, but we also do wear eye protection and shields. Um, so we are completely protected um, in the event that someone is coughing and you have that dr the droplets in the air. We like to protect our eyewear. But for someone in the regular world, just try to wear multi-layered masks. Um, they do have, I know Copper uh, designed some gator necks that you can pull up and those are multi-layered as well. I get very frustrated um, hearing people talk about being tired of wearing their masks. They wear their masks all day at work. Um, and I almost, I tell my husband all the time because when I first bought him his respirator, he said he didn't like it. And I said, well, if you don't like the way this respirator is, you're not gonna like the intubation tube down, going down your throat either. Mm. So it's either you help yourself now or we're going to have to help you in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so y'all wear the regular basic mask. I do want to show you what I wear for work. Um, so I wear my surgical cap simply because my mask um, has the straps on it and it pulls my hair. So um, this is a respirator that I wear and it's called the Invo. Um, and it comes with the shield. So that way uh, my filter is protected. I have a filter underneath here. And then on the inside of the mask, there is a gel border. So that way it actually fits to my face. Mm 
The um, masks that we first started wearing at the beginning of COVID-19 are not, um, they have like a, a metal border here. And with me taking it on and off to try and consume water as a mother, I was noticing that I did not have a good uh, fit. So this was why I invested in the Envo mask. And so the Envo mask also has a two-way valve that you cannot see. But this is what I wear to work. Um, in addition to my face shield um, that you don't see, I left that there, my apologies. But I bought this one instead of the big dark Vader because that one, my patients couldn't hear me. So they could still hear me when I wear this one. But this is what I wear for 10 hours, Monday through Friday. I do not take it off to protect myself, my patients and my family. Mm -hmm. So um, I laugh when patients say they don't like wearing the cloth mask because this is what we look like in the hospital, okay? Um, and I'm pretty sure y'all have seen the pictures on Facebook of the mask knee um, and how our faces are breaking out. We get pressure injuries on our nose um, simply because we have constant compression on our face. Um, but that is what I wear every single day. My husband wears one as well. And those are not provided by the hospital. This is an investment that we made to protect ourselves. Okay, well, that, that's good information because, you know, we don't think about it in that way, you know, so like, um, because I work for the government, so they started every, no matter where you are, all day at your desk, as long as you're in that building or on that base, you have to wear a mask. Right. Um, going into the gate, starting from the point from in gate entry all the through the day. So it's like a, a long day <laughs> yeah. wearing mask. And I don't wear anything close to what you are wearing. Uh, my hat is off to you all <laughs> because it does look like it's a lot. Um, and people do get, they are starting to get tired and it, they are starting to get frustrated and everybody want their life back, you know? So, um, but I, tend to think that the norm, the norm that they're trying to get back to is never going to be again. Uh, <laughs> that's just what I think. Um, but uh, my question to you is, while you're in the hospital, I, you know, and I know that nurses and, and, and doctors and PAs go through a lot of stuff during the day. Give me one thing that keeps you going as you are going through your everyday and things are getting tough. What is it that keeps you focused and going? That's a tough question because there's so much um, that keeps me going. Um, as I've had students, they, they ask me why this group, why PA? why not nurses or MDs? Um, I love the freedom of my job. And I deal with so much on a regular basis. But yet I thank God that I still have the autonomy to do what needs to be done in that moment. And if I need to stop and sit with my patient for 20 minutes because they don't have anybody else, I can stay there for 20 minutes and give that patient my undivided attention. I have been doing so many FaceTimes and Google duos with family members because the staff in the hospital doesn't have time to do it or the electronics are not working to do it. You know, the nurses have they're stretched beyond belief. And I'm happy that I have so much autonomy that when I'm on the phone with you as a crying family member, I can say, hold on, let me Google duo your family member that's laying in this bed so that you can see them for the last time. I can push pause on my day and be that middleman for the people who cannot come in with their family. And I think that is the biggest thing that I'm most grateful for in my service, regardless of how busy I am, 
I can push pause when I need to. And you, you said something that I just wanted to back up on. You said that people want their life back. Mm. And I have had to watch just this week, two patients between the ages of 50 and 60 take their last breath because of COVID. And I've had to sit on the phone with their family members talking about how they did not even know that they had comorbidities or any kind of medical issues. And I had to tell their family members, stop it. Stop hollering, stop screaming. We're here trying to fight for your family member's life. And I need you to hear what I'm saying. I need you to breathe so that we can fight. And it's so many people that are coming into the hospital that are not aware of their coronary artery disease. They're not aware of their renal insufficiency. And when you come into the hospital because of COVID-19, it's causing this massive inflammatory response of the body that it's flaring up all of your medical conditions at one time. And my one patient that was 57 years old, her lungs were shutting down, her heart was shutting down, her kidneys were shutting down. And I got called after she was in the hospital for four days because now her leg is dying and that's trying to kill her on top of all of the other things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And so what y'all see is the lack of smell, the lack of taste. I have to sit in my house for two weeks. To that, I say, that's cute. That's a blessing that that's all you have to deal with. Okay. When I saw the first patient that we took care of that had multi-system organ failure because of COVID, she became my patient because she was in the hospital for so long. You know, when we're fighting for your life, we don't worry about turning you and offloading your bottom and all of that. I mean, we, we try. But if I turn you and it's making your respiratory status decrease and you can't breathe, then I'm not going to turn you. So if you're in the ICU for a month, then the tissue on your behind is going to naturally die because the bones are just pressing down into that skin. So here we are, we're getting ready to celebrate and, and, and discharge or downgrade from the ICU. And now I've got to deal with the fact that they have a large area of dead tissue on their behind because we've been fighting for her life for so long. So now I've got to do bring another surgeon in to come in, clean all of that tissue off, the bones infected. We've got to bring your colon out to your stomach so that way the stool is not getting mixed into the wound so that way you can heal. So thank you, Jesus. We made it through all of that, but now let's deal with all of the complications of getting through that. Or the patients that get their legs amputated because their heels have been digging into the bed because they're, they can't get up. And we do the best that we can, but we're, it's so much going on at one time. We have to focus on what is life-threatening at that time. So not only do I do vascular, but I also do the wound care side of things. And I honestly, I think the wound care side is more frustrating because it's going to take me six to eight months to even start making progress with this wound on your bottom. So it's, it's, it's rough because you say people are saying they want their life back, mm -hmm. but what about all of these people that don't get their life back? They come into the hospital with COVID-19 walking, talking, and perfectly fine with kids, and they're leaving on oxygen, on dialysis, with a large hole in their bottom. And then they can't walk either because they've had muscle atrophy from being in the hospital for three months. That's how they're leaving. And so then you have to ask yourself, what's the quality of life? The number of hospice and palliative care conversations that I have to have with family members, because I have to ask you, when was the last time you saw your mother? August of 2020? 
because I couldn't send her home. She had to go to a facility and the facilities are locked down because of COVID. So you really don't know what your mother looks like. Hmm. You have not talked to her on the phone because she physically cannot pick up the phone. You don't know about the tube that they had to surgically put into her so that she could breathe because she's not passing air and the machine next to her bed has to breathe for her. Oh, you didn't know about that. Okay. And so now here I am on the wound care side, I have to take all that together and paint that picture for you. And so I have to start the conversation off as, ma'am, sir, I'm not trying to, to be rude or try to scare you, but I think it's important that I explain to you what your family member looks like because you haven't seen them in six to eight months. And, and yet you're telling me, keep doing everything, keep doing everything, keep doing everything. And we're like, okay, let me explain to you what everything is. And as someone on the outside, you don't really understand what everything is. Mm -hmm. And so when you say they want their life back, I'm like, wow. Sweetie, I can't give you your mother back the way that she came in here ever. Those are those difficult conversations that I'm having to have. And to hear one of my patient's sisters that, that cry out, it just rings in my ear. That's what we have to deal with. As you say, you want your life back because you don't want to wear a multi-layered mask. So yeah, some of my family talks to me about COVID-19 and they think that I'm overreacting and <laughs> okay. But when you have to do this every day, all day, mm -hmm. that's why I'm so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can understand, I can understand why it's gotta be, it's very difficult, you know? Um, and, and when you think about the magnitudes of people who will never have a life again, you know, we've over 500,000 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 or something that triggered, COVID-19 triggered. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, getting our life back is minimal, you know, having a life is, is, is at this point in time is, is great. Right. You know, it's a blessing. Um, so to wear a mask, you know, just find something that's comfortable and keep it pushing. Right. <laughs> keep it pushing right. because we don't want to be end up being one of your patients. And that is a true thing. We don't want our loved ones to be a patient that we have to have those conversations about because COVID has totally destroyed everything that they knew um, to be. Uh, normal. So now it's, it's just, it's just, we just have to deal with where we are in, in this life. And I think for this time being, we have to accept that this is our normal right now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be our normal for a while. But at this point, after a year in, you should be comfortable with your normal. <laughs> you Pretty should. And I'm fearful for those who are not comfortable in their normal, that are still looking for something to satisfy them in this moment and as a risk, exposing themselves to this virus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Kim? <laughs> You have a question? <laughs> Your question for today? Trouble. I think, yeah. So you yeah, have I think she's having some difficulties. Is it off mute now? We can hear you. Okay, I apologize. It keeps going in and out of mute. I don't know what's going on with my computer. I apologize. But I do have a question. What is the youngest age that you start placing masks on children? My daughter, I think the recommendations are four. 
my daughter was wearing a mask when she was two. Um, and I even purchased the plastic face shields with the, the glasses. There's an animal on the top. She wears that. Um, when we're out in public, she knows to keep her mask on. When we get out of the car, she automatically, mommy, I got my mask on. Um, but my daughter wears a mask and she's three years old. And then my son is six months old. And when we go out, he's in a carrier and I keep him covered with a blanket. So both of my children are covered in public. I really, um, I know I'm extra, <laughs> uh, but my children are not out in public without a mask on. Um, and if we ever do go out, it's short, sweet, and to the point. So what is the youngest age that you have seen uh, go through some of the horrific side effects of COVID? So um, for me, remember I'm vascular surgery and wound care. Uh, my youngest patient was 32, okay. 32. Um, and his infection was four weeks after COVID. He presented to the hospital and he complained of numbness and tingling to his left leg. Um, usually when your leg is dying, it looks purple, blue, you're screaming, can't walk on it, and it's ice cold. He mm. came because it was numb and tingling, um, which is not a normal presentation. And so it wasn't, when I touched him, it was warm. Um, I was actually questioning why he got admitted to the hospital. Um, but when we did the ultrasound of his leg, we immediately saw that he did not have blood on the left side and he had normal blood flow on the right side, which is an automatic indication that we need to move. Um, we ended up doing what we call thrombolysis. We put an IV in his right groin and we went inside the arteries to take pictures. And that was when we saw that he had clot in the arteries from his belly button all the way down to his left leg. And all he had was numbness and tingling. Um, during this case, we put you in the ICU. We draw your labs around the clock um, because it's very dangerous. We can cause spontaneous bleeding in your head. Uh, so we have to watch your labs and make sure that your blood is not getting too thick. Um, I distinctly remember this case because I was watching his labs and the values were so high on his fibrinogen, which means that the blood is too thick. And I remember calling my surgeon frustrated beyond belief because I'm like, how is it that we're giving him such a large amount of this blood thinning medication that can put him at risk for a hemorrhagic stroke and yet his blood be this thick? And the only answer was it's COVID. COVID makes you sit in an inflammatory state and it causes your blood to be extremely thick. And he almost lost his leg. We have been in the operating room, staring at the artery and watching as it odd, it just reclots off. The blood is just that thick. Um, so we have had to push beyond belief uh, to fight for extremities. I've had an ischemic arm, lady lost her arm uh, because of the same situation that on top of legs, it's, it's very frustrating, but he was 32 years old and almost lost his leg. We won that battle, thank God. Um, I, I wear PVA very proud. I have amazing surgeons behind me. Um, there've been many of situations where everyone else gives up um, multi-system organ failure because of COVID-19 and the extremity dies and everybody else is saying that there's nothing else that we can do. And my surgeons come in and they're ready to fight. Um, I wear PVA very proud um, to work behind so many amazing surgeons that provide such awesome care for the community. Um, but to see them stumped over 55 years of experience and to see them stumped, it's, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. So to follow up on something I heard you say, so some of these people 
did not have any previous conditions before they had COVID and COVID caused conditions after they dealt with COVID, it caused other conditions in their body? So what we're seeing is you're presenting to the hospital and I'm asking you, what kind of medical issues do you have? And you're saying none, mm-hmm. okay? The question is, do you really not have any or have you been screened? Did you have underlying blockages in your heart and you just didn't know about it? Or maybe that chest pain that you had last week, you thought it was gas and it really wasn't gas. It was a minor heart attack, but you didn't go get it checked out to know that you had coronary artery disease. And so if you did not know that you had these medical conditions, COVID's flaring them up. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that every single patient in the hospital that is having complications has comorbidities? No, but I see the worst of the worst. So my pot of patients have them, but I do have patients that come in and they tell me they do not have any medical issues, but it's just because you do not have a primary care doctor or you don't follow up with them, or you've never had a stress test um, to know that you've had these blockages. You have the blockages. You're just not symptomatic. You don't, you're not aware of them. You don't know that you have diabetes because you don't get a hemoglobin A1C. And so the inflammatory state of COVID is exacerbating all of this. You come in the hospital and we're telling you, sweetie, you're, you're one stage away from dialysis. You, you didn't know that. Okay. Let's get you a kidney doctor. (laughs) Yeah. So with, with, you know, um, I'm listening and it, you're giving out some, uh, some really great information, mm-hmm. things that, you know, I never would have even thought, you know, that COVID could it push borderline um, things into like this big giant thing <laughs> in your body. So you, it, and it's important to listen to your body. So, and, and, and I always try to go back to like with the African-American community or the Brown community, um, black and Brown community as the, they're saying now, I guess that's politically correct. <laughs> so what is it with that you would like for us as a community to know about specific screenings and getting to know what's going on in our bodies. How would we know and how often should we have these um, screenings? And what do we say to our doctor to get them to give us these screenings? So, you know, I'm just interested in that because at certain ages, we got to do different things. So um, I, I want to remind you, I'm vascular surgeon. I know you are, but you know some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just general knowledge, general it knowledge. Is, it is, but you have to realize that at the top of the totem pole, you would have to assess your risk factors. Um, what kind of diseases are you um, predestined for with your family history? Do you have high blood pressure, diabetes? Do you have a history of strokes, aneurysms, heart attacks, okay? If people in your family have it, that means that you should be on the radar looking for it in your own health. Um, And I feel that anybody over the age of 30 should have a primary care physician. And you should at least be seen by your primary physician at least once a year, at least for baseline labs just to be screened. And then from that point, if you start at that, at that point, then they're going to start to point you in the correct direction for these screens, okay? Um, we're also, and we haven't talked about it yet, but cancer. Um, cancer makes you, your blood thick. So cancer on top of COVID, good Lord Jesus. <laughs> It's mm. not pretty. Um, but those are all things that we're finding. I've diagnosed one person with cancer as a vascular surgical PA, you know, um, that they didn't know anything about. So 
I would say that you should have a primary care physician and you should be following up with them routinely at least a year for your baseline labs. Um, when you start getting your stress tests, um, your colonoscopy and all of that is going to be based on your risk factors and the age. Um, but you need to be on someone's radar uh, and definitely screening also for your diabetes. Anybody that's diabetic, my first question is, um, are you controlled? And they say, yes. And I say, what's your hemoglobin A1C? And they say, I don't know it. Well, then you're not controlled. Hmm. You're not controlled. There's no way that you can control it and you don't know where you sit. Um, and your hemoglobin A1C is a three month average of your sugars. And that's how you find out whether or not you're controlled. But these are all baseline guidelines that you should be getting from your primary care physician. So if you don't look for one, then how can they provide this information for you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question. You talked about inflammation. And I know as for people who are trying to be healthy or drinking healthy drinks or, you know, doing healthy things, what would you recommend they do to keep inflammation down as much as possible if they are primarily healthy um, to make sure that this doesn't flare up or something is happening behind the scenes that you don't know about, but you could have done something about it. Um, you know, whether it's over the counter, whether it's holistic or whatever, what would you recommend as an overall daily health routine? So um, I do have a regimen for my patients. I am a little nervous to give it to you being that I am on Facebook and I'm always concerned about people that do not have established care. And then mm -hmm. they turn around and do these things um, and come across complications. Mm -hmm. So um, inflammation, I think what we have to realize is that your body is, is made up of tubes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have a tube that the air goes through. The blood flows through tubes. Um, the stool goes through tubes. Mm -hmm. Kidneys perfuse through tubes. And when we talk about inflammation, what happens to the tube? I don't have something to show you, but you go from a tube this big and then it gets inflamed. So the hole comes to here. This is the problem with COVID-19 is that you lose this big hole and it comes all the way down. So the inflammation of your airway and why your COVID-19 is being intubated is because you go from a trachea that's this, this larger bronchioli that are alveoli that are this large and the inflammation brings it down to here. And so now you're not getting the air through. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept with blood flow to your legs, your heart, your kidneys. And so there are medications to decrease the inflammation. Um, you have your statins, okay, for your high cholesterol, but we in vascular don't care about the numbers, okay? If you have arterial insufficiency, we do not wanna take the plaque in the artery and add inflammation to it. We're trying to keep the plaque, the pipe as big as we possibly can. So your statins are going to decrease the inflammation within the pipe, okay? Your antiplatelets, Plavix and aspirin, those keep your, bloods, your um, blood from being so sticky to where now it sticks to the plaque inside the pipe and it helps the blood flow through easier, okay? Those are normal recommendations that I have from a vascular standpoint, but then when you do that, you have to be concerned about people with underlying GI issues. Do you have stomach ulcers? Um, do you have cancer where it could cause bleeding and stuff like that? So if you have not been followed up by a primary care physician or been screened for any of this and you start this regimen and then you start coughing up blood or your stool turns black and tarry, then you have to be careful with all of that. So before you start any regimen, you should be checking with your primary care physician um, to make sure that it's a safe regimen for you. Um, as far as holistic medicine, um, I really do not have 
any uh, evidence-based medicine on that uh, to provide information for you. But COVID-19, it is an inflammatory response on the body. And so the goal is to decrease inflammation. Okay. 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 I have read up. I don't know if you know, um, Sister Kim and I, she, I had a trampoline because I read up that uh, loosens the, the, the lymph, the acid in your lymph nodes which also can get backed up and that causes, you know, a lot of issues in your body and it causes inflammation. So I have noticed that jumping on the trampoline does make me feel better. It does bring circulation. I feel the blood circulating through my body better. Um, and, you know, the things that I have been reading are all positive. So do you have a recommended exercise that people could do to uh, add to being healthy as far as their heart, as their circulation, you know, fighting inflammation? What would you recommend? It's physical exercise, period. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody should have some level of physical activity in their life, uh, three to five days a week. Uh, they, the studies are showing that you have to exercise for at least 20 minutes before you start burning fat. Um, but you should have physical exercise period from an arterial standpoint, um, or vascular standpoint, we encourage physical activity because the pipes that you were born with, the native pipes are blocked with plaque. And mm -hmm. when you participate in physical activity, your muscles are demanding more blood. And so your body is saying the highway that we normally pass it through is shut down. So it starts to build new arteries, causes arterialization. Your body makes new little highways um, to get blood down to your feet. And so that's how we have patients who their, their arteries are blocked from their knees down, the main arteries, but yet their feet are still alive. And so the first thing that we will have you do when you come to our office is physical activity. You have, it's a supply and demand system. And so every single patient should be in some kind of physical activity program. Um, what you can do is based on you and your life and, and your medical condition. Um, some people have bad arthritis and they need to be in pools. Um, for my patients, I take whatever I can get. If your heart rate is going up, then I'm happy. Um, whether it's a, it's a recumbent bike or you're outside running, it's whatever your body can tolerate. I just need for you to get your heart rate up. Um, but even still, I tell my patients, don't park at the back of the grocery store. And just that walking, you know, I ask them when you go into the store and you see the fruit, can you walk all the way to the back where the milk is? No, I have to stop at the bread. Okay. So what I need you to do is the next time you go to the store, don't stop at the bread. Go to the soda owl. <laughs> don't stop until you get to the soda owl. And then you'll notice that, okay, now I can make it to the coffee owl. Okay, now I can make it to the milk owl. But the, this is how I have to talk to my patients so that I can make sure that they understand. But when you have arterial insufficiency, you just have to push your body a little bit farther. Um, and that causes you to satisfy this supply and demand, but the entire body functions on this, on this phenomenon, whether it's your heart, your arteries, your lungs, physical activity is going to help improve it. I mean, how does it affect the lungs? What's the issue with COVID-19 is that you, you feel like you've been hit by a bus. So you're laying in bed, you're not exerting any activity. So you're taking these very short pants. So why is COVID-19 associated with pneumonia? Because you're not taking in deep breaths and exchanging the air at the base of the lungs. And so all of that junk just settles down at the base of the lungs because you're not breathing in. And now you get an infection in your lungs because there's no exchange. And so our post-op patients, they haven't been taking deep breaths. What do we give them? Incident spirometer. And we give them that little tube, breathe in, go, 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 go. You know, and it's the same concept. That's what physical activity does for you. Your heart is a muscle. 
And if you are constantly doing physical activity, then it gets stronger as a muscle and you, you decrease your risk of heart failure. I mean, that's what heart failure is. The muscle is tired and it won't pump anymore. So if you start training your body and you strengthen it through physical activity, then you decrease the risk of some of these comorbidities. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate all the wonderful information you have given us. Oh my goodness, a lot to think about. Um, um, Monday, back to exercising normally. Uh, and... I mean, really, you know, knowing that there's things we can do to help ourselves and there are things we can help prevent as much as possible by just taking these basic steps. And you've given us a whole plethora of information that is vital to life. And we thank you for that. And if you would, if you would take a moment to pray for those who maybe listening now or may listen later and give them a prayer of hope and a prayer of faith and just pray for those things that the Lord puts on your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, first and foremost to say thank you. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace. Thank you for putting us and its path, God, to protect your people and to provide them with the services that you have given us the ability to perform. Thank you for protecting us and allowing us to perform these services. Thank you for protecting our mind and allowing us to have the mental capacity to do so. Yes. But God, I ask that you sit with every single frontline worker, yes. whether it be in the hospital, in the grocery store, at the gas station, anybody that has to go out to help people get what they need in their everyday life. Lord, I thank you for giving us the ability to be able to impact others. And as we do that, Lord, I thank you. And I ask that you continue to protect us as we go forth, protect us so that we can continue to impact your people, guide our hands, guide our hearts and guide our minds. God, I ask that you help open up the ears and soften the hearts of everybody that is listening, yes. help give them the wisdom that they need to continue to be protected during this pandemic. But even more so God in everything that I've seen, I've asked that you just give us a sense of peace, allow the Holy Spirit to come and rest on our hearts and our minds, sit with all of these family members that have lost family members to COVID-19 sit with those family members who currently have patients in the hospital that they cannot see and give them a sense of peace and allow the Holy Spirit to rest on them, God. Yes. ask that you continue to provide for us and continue to bless us with your grace, continue to kiss us in the middle of the night as we get up yes. every day to continue to fight this battle. And even more so, God, I ask that you continue to bless the prayer warriors, continue to give them the strength to uphold all of us and everything that we do. I ask that you continue to keep us on their hearts, Lord, as they are giving us strength to continue to do. And they pray for us and they pray for those who are not able to pray for themselves. We thank you. We thank you for everything that you're doing in the midst of this pandemic, because we know that you are awesome and we know that you are able to do everything, God. These are the blessings that we ask in your son, Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, P.A. Lampkin, <laughs> we truly appreciate you being here with us on today. Yes, and we, yes. um, I receive every word that you prayed. I, I pray that someone was blessed by what yes. you said to us on today, because it was a lot of good information. And, and we always like it when people speak from their heart. And today you poured your heart out. Um, on behalf of the people you service and serve and their, even their family members. So mm -hmm. we thank God for you and those who work with you, those that are in the hospitals that are pulling long shifts and, and missing family time and all mm -hmm. of that. We, we are praying for you on We Care. Uh, we are your support team. Yes. Whether y'all know it or not, we pray for you all every Thursday. <laughs> so we thank you again for uh, being with us and, and we love you. 
and we may need you to come back again. So um, next time it won't be around your birthday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. And we appreciate you. Yes. We Care Ministries, um, uh, we hope of uh, support team, we hope that you have enjoyed our discussion on today. Please uh, join us next time, uh, the second Saturday in March. It's March 13th at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time for our next discussion. We will be discussing new and different topics every second and fourth Saturday at 4 p.m. So if you can, please join us. We Care Ministry support team uh, is here for you. So if you've lost someone, if you're having a difficult time, you need special prayer, please uh, submit your prayer request to us. Uh, you can instant message us. You can send us an email at wecare.ministry at att.net. <laughs> and uh, we will be glad to um, um, pray with you. You can also set up an appointment on the, our page if you would like us to set a time aside to pray for you. Um, we at We Care Ministries also have a YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and look at some of the old discussions that we have, they may have blessed you then and they may you may want them to bless someone else. You can share them. So please go and support us. Uh, we Care Ministries support team will be praying for you, your loved one and your family members every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. So please submit your prayer request today. You can do that today and we will be praying for you throughout the week, not just on Thursday. Every time the Lord lays you on our heart, we pray for you. So don't forget to like, share and follow us on Facebook. And we often say, and we have began to say that if you are looking for a way to minister, please share our prayers. Everybody needs prayer. And if you don't know, have a way to uh, minister that is an effective way to minister to someone's heart and it can encourage someone and remember we care ministry support team is here here helping you to navigate through so tell your family and your friends and your loved ones about we care ministry support team we'll see you next time have a blessed weekend God bless you <laughs> all right y'all